Um, I'm going to make a short introduction into the IMS core for Volta running on top of Camaglio. Um, I've uh, planned a little schedule for today. And I want to start a little bit with uh, what happened in the last year in terms of Camaglio and IMS. I wanted to give a little bit of an infrastructure overview. And then, of course, I want to show a little bit how easy it is actually to install the components. Um, first of all, IMS, uh, I heard in a presentation not long ago, uh, somebody said, well, IMS is best of the 80s. Something that somebody liked maybe 20 years ago and uh, nobody, really, um, nobody really used it somehow because, uh, yeah, they had a 2G, 3G infrastructure, but uh, yeah, IMS is cool, it's nice, but we don't really need it. Well, with the evolution of mobile networks, this has changed uh, dramatically. Um, one of the main reasons for this is Basically, now we have Volta. And with voice over LTE and with the LTE network, the LTE network is, in, uh, is not like 2G, 3G, where we have a dedicated uh, channel for voice and a dedicated channel for, for data. On LTE, we have data only. So the classic voice technology that we have on 2G, 3G simply doesn't work anymore. Another main reason now is basically that um, if you are a mobile operator, of course, there's one major point that you can throw money at as much as you want, but it's still somehow limited, and that's spectrum. Everybody nowadays is uh, requesting more data. Everybody wants to surf the internet. They want to do YouTube, whatever video applications on their mobile handset. So we need to be more efficient on the mobile network. If I take a traditional 2G, 3G network, then um, we use at the moment about 40% of the spectrum for voice. 40%, that is really huge. Um, if, we, if, we, if we take uh, a voice over LTE network, it's down to 10%. That's a huge saving for the mobile operator. And last but not least, of course, always the total cost of ownership of a mobile network is also a really big topic. If you're building a new network, if you're building a new LTE network, then building an LTE network is way cheaper than 3G or even 2G. So you see a lot of uh, greenfield deployments, especially in Africa and Asia and various countries. Even in Europe uh, nowadays, we have some LTE networks which are pure LTE, pure 4G, and they simply skipped uh, all the technology that was before. So uh, Volta is a big, big topic. Um, in the last year, we've been really, really busy. Uh, one thing we've added to Camaglio was Ravel. And we added support for 3GPP 2328 NXU. And of course, we wanted to have stability, 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 performance, performance, performance. That was our main goal for the last year. As a matter of fact, right now, you can actually use Camaglio IMS and Volta on uh, three major mobile networks throughout Europe. It's really, we've been really busy. And it's, even though I have to admit that there's uh, friendly user trials at the moment, but okay, you have to be a friendly user, but you can use it countrywide. And this is totally a great feeling. I'm coming from the mobile network, uh, from a mobile network, so I basically know <laughs> what all the stuff stands for. But I guess most of you don't. So Ravel, what the hell is Ravel? And Ravel is really, really simple. But as you know from mobile networks, if you, if you speak with mobile network operators, they really love to, to use words for stuff that's really simple. Ravel really describes a simple mechanism for using a local breakout during roaming scenarios. It's a roaming architecture for voice over AMS with a local breakout. Imagine, just a quick idea, just an 
if you, if you do basic IMS, if you do basic Volta, then of course, if you, you would connect to your home network and your home network would route your call. If you um, imagine you're in far, far away, South America, Asia, somewhere, um, and you make a call because you want to get a Uber or you want to get a taxi or something. Do you really want to route your call from Asia back to maybe Germany, back to Asia just to get connected to the taxi driver? No, most likely not, because that's way too inefficient and with long distance voice transmission, that's really, it's unnecessary traffic, it's really, uh, the, the quality is suffering. So what Ravel basically does is if we have a proxy CSCF in our visited network, this is the network that we're roaming in. We're now basically in Asia, for example. And my proxy CSCF, which is assigned during the LTE attach, um, is basically my first outbound proxy for making a call. So what this proxy CSCF does is really no really black magic. It simply adds a new header, which, is, um, which describes the transit routing function of my visited network. Now, the home network can actually decide to use that transit routing function, which got announced during the initial call setup. So basically, in the invite, we get back feature caps with a loopback indicator at uh, the transit routing function, which is a really, really simple, I would say, some sort of a gateway for the visited network, would simply allow us to, to make the call directly from Asia. The signaling would still go to my home network because maybe I want to check if the, if the account is valid, if he paid his bills, whatever. Um, but for, for the voice routing, for the voice signaling, for RTP, we would use the transit routing function of the visited network. Then, of course, there was another thing that I was blabbling about. Uh, the 3GPP NXU. Uh, and if you don't know what it is, don't feel ashamed. When people asked me to implement this, uh, I was a little bit, okay, uh, yeah, whatever, I have to look it up. So it's really nothing, <laughs> nothing to be ashamed of if you don't know, even if you work with IMS. The NXU is quite simple. We're talking about WebRTC for IMS. WebRTC, everybody knows WebRTC, uh, it's basically just another channel to connect to our IMS core. It's really, uh, so the specification is like 10 pages and it's really, you should, you would, blah, blah, blah. It's not really uh, specific, but um, it describes the basic mechanisms for connecting to an IMS cloud um, using WebRTC. Why do we want this? Of course, on the one hand, we want to use voice over LTE. Voice over LTE as a native device technology to be integrated in your device to make normal phone calling. Then, of course, we want to do voice over Wi-Fi. So that's another access technology we can use on our mobile handset. And we want to use OTT apps because maybe not every phone supports Volta, like my Nexus 6 here. It's an old brick, it supports LTE, but no voice over LTE yet. Um, with Camaleo, IMS, and Volta, we can now connect like almost every device that I've come across to our IMS platform, which is actually quite nice. We can use fixed line devices, and now with this NXU extension, we can even connect web RTC endpoints. Um, in a, I, th I think at Tatec in London, I said I want to have one platform for all devices. One, any device, any platform, any technology. We should be able to connect and we should be able to make calls. I think I've used this picture in the last years over and over again because this is basically the basic IMS architecture. The basic IMS architecture is about a proxy CSCF, a proxy call session control function. Um, it's nothing else than an outbound proxy. 
And the outbound proxy gets assigned to your device. Um, you could do it via DHCP assigning a, a zip proxy. You can use it during the LTE attach. You can uh, configure it uh, manually if you, if you have some uh, sort of provisioning system. Why is it important that uh, we use an outbound proxy? Because we separate the core network, which is our application, it is our core routing, from, from the access network. And the proxy CSCF normally is pretty close to the, to, to the access network. We need to be close to the access network because, at least on the mobile network, we need to um, manage quality of service. We need to announce to the mobile network that uh, we are going to make a voice call. And we want to negotiate maybe, okay, what capabilities do we have on the mobile network? What can we do in a voice call? Um, if I'm a mobile operator, I'm not, but uh, you never know, maybe some, someday, then of course I want to have my voice, voice service the best quality because it's my voice service. I'm offering the service. Um, so um, my voice service will have maximum priority above everything else. Um, this is the main difference between a Volta and IMS and any OTT app like Skype, like Viber, like anything else. We have native network integration. So um, while basically all data on the mobile network is done uh, best effort, on the mobile network we do quality of service by uh, prioritizing our voice services. But this is not a one-way street, actually. If we, have, um, if we have this quality of service set up, then we get also the feedback that, okay, uh, you want to do a voice call, a, a video call? Mm, maybe that's not a good idea at the moment because my network is quite loaded, so please don't do that. So this is also some information we can exchange uh, via this diameter interface. And this is also some information that we maybe only have in the network that we're actually uh, connected in into the, in the LTE network. So, um, after we connected to the proxy CSCF, we go to the integrating CSCF. The integrating CSCF is some sort of, a, I would say, maybe likely an intelligent load balancer. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> the interrogating CSCF will basically um, decide what summing CSCF you should send your call to. Let's assume, um, normally, of course, this is very simplified because in a real network, I wouldn't have one single instance of serving CSF or interrogating CSF or anything. Um, but if I register my mobile phone to the LTE network, then I'm registered on one specific server, on one specific serving CSCF. If I get, um, and of course, any other subsequent requests that may come, let's make a call set up, let's make um, inbound calls, maybe, maybe I want to do some line limiting, whatever, it has to go to the same serving CSCF. So in order to um, achieve this, we have the interrogating CSCF, which will simply forward the request to the right serving CSCF. Um, the interrogating CSCF and the serving CSCF are connected to a database to the home subscriber server. The home subscriber server is basically a, a network component that uh, shows authentication, which shows some service profiles, which shows some um, uh, basically everything that we need in terms of authentication. It shows um, what applications we have in the network, what's, what's the user profile, stuff like that. Um, yeah, um, so basically the call comes in, goes to the serving CSCF. The serving CSCF may decide to route it to an application server. An application server can basically be any kind of zip endpoint. Like having an SMS gateway, if you do uh, SMS over IP, that's typically an application server. Or if you want to do some 
and hangs telephony call forwarding stuff like that. That's an application server because it has nothing to do with the core network functionality. Um, if you look through um, all kinds of IMS specifications and books, you see all kinds of RX, CX, DX, ROSH. It's really, um, it's a name for a specific reference point, but in the end, it's, everything is diameter. It's either zip or diameter, most of the cases. And um, so don't worry too much about uh, SH, CX, DX, or any other interface. Okay. Questions so far? <laughs> yeah? Yes, uh, so uh, given that there may be a multitude of applications and application servers that provide them, what sort of standardized mechanism exists to have the serving CSCF and kind of have the intelligence to decide which application server to use for what? Is it framed in terms of SIP methods or diameter capabilities list? As application server, right, <laughs> okay. Um, it's basically done based on um, parts of the zip message. We analyze the zip message and we decide like, um, okay, for example, we have um, a specific content type that we want to route and we want to have zip message, content type X, epsilon, should go to that application server at first. And this is, this is standardized? This is standardized, yeah. This is all kept in the user profile of the home subscriber server. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, can I ask another question? Yeah. Back to the, uh, to the transient network function. Yeah. Uh, is, are there standards that define the nature of the interconnect that must exist for this to work? No. So it, it, it's presumed that the, the, that the transient proxy is reachable yeah. by the whole network. Exactly, over exactly. The public internet, over no, no, it's a, it's a trusted connection between the mobile network operator, like a dedicated line, so the, just so for signaling. There exists a, a mechanism for SIP interconnection in a kind of SS7-like trusted network way. Um, or is it basically improvisational? It's, it's, it's basically, um, the security is basically on network level. So, um, it's not reachable on the public internet because that would, <laughs> of course, probably allow some abuse, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it must be reachable by the home uh, network. But is this operator defined? Or is there this is operator so defined. Is there some consortium or operator of an MPLS file that's local or reachable in nature? Um, basically, um, this mechanism is uh, defined by the GSMA. And it's, of course, it's up to the operator to simply ignore this header. It can use this header if it wants to, but if I want to use my local gateway or I don't support this feature, then pff, so what? Um, the visited network can offer this functionality, but it's free to you. Free, you're free to use it or not. So it's operator defined. It's operator defined, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, if we do IMS, there are a few really important things to know. First of all, um, we use quite heavily um, DNS, and DNS is really mandatory. Like uh, quite, from time to time, we, somebody asks, well, I can't, I've added this to my local host file, that simply won't work. We really have to define um, uh, DNS. In this case, uh, I have uh, took the example of a, uh, okay, um, if, I, if I look at mobile networks, then uh, we've got a country code, 001, which is international uh, test network, and a mobile network code, uh, which is um, 
also for the test network. Uh, each country uh, has its own uh, country code. In Germany, it's 262 for Germany. And then, for example, 01 is uh, T-Mobile in Germany. So um, these first five digits are usually even stored on the SIM card. If you look at your IMSI, you would typically see SIM cards in Germany starting with 26201 if you're on T-Mobile, 26207 if you're on Telefonica's O2 network, stuff like that. Um, with this information, a mobile phone, a Volta handset, can actually uh, determine its own home network. Because we know the mobile country code and the mobile network code. Um, so in the beginning, we need to set up DNS and bind. And uh, we need all kinds of um, proxy CSCF, uh, NIEPTR records. We need um, SRV records quite a lot because we want to have, for example, um, in our lab setup, we've got two different interrogating CSCF, which are basically selected based on uh, route robin. Um, we use actually DNS uh, for all kinds of uh, load balancing, failover, stuff like that. Um, if you have a mobile network, um, then the proxy CSCF um, is, um, is uh, given to you uh, by the network attached. So it's, it's really like DHCP. You get this uh, proxy CSCF assigned during the network attach. Um, yeah. The next thing we need um, on the basic installation of Camayo and all the IMS network components, one big, 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 really big hint. Use the trunk version of Camayo. Trunk is the best at the moment. Um, it's Basically, it's a very agile, very active development going on. So um, at the moment, we don't really stick to the version numbers, like uh, having version 4.4, a stable IMS version. Trunk is better. It's really, really better. If you want to have a mobile network, if you want to run IMS, you need uh, an HSS, a home subscriber server, as a central profile database. Um, the open HSS from Fraunhofer, it's not the fastest home subscriber server, but it does, it works well for getting started. If you, if you later decide to, to grow bigger, you can actually replace the Fraunhofer open HSS with, I think, almost quite any HSS that we've come across so far. We've tested this with Nokia Siemens networks, uh, and Nokia Siemens networks is especially said to be very standards compliant. We've tested it with Ericsson, we've tested it with ZTE, and uh, ZTE is always a good copy of Ericsson, and we've tested it with Huawei HSS. So it should basically work um, with uh, any HSS that you would find on the market. Um, if not, tell me, then we will probably fix it. Um, I don't want to go through the installation of, um, of the trunk version of Kamali because that's documented uh, in the wiki over and over by Daniel and others. So that's um, really um, not necessary. One thing, if you want to do a voice over LTE, you have to use the AMR codec. Uh, the AMR codec is adaptive multi-rate uh, uh, audio optimized uh, codec, uh, and it's um, it's a very tricky codec if you look into the codec because it's really adapts to the current network um, conditions. Most likely, a little bit like like Opus would do. Um, in most of our setups, we use ZEMS, the Zip Express Media Server, another great uh, project of the Fraunhofer Institute. And we've added the AMR codec to that uh, project as well. It's available on GitHub. But um, AMR has one uh, 
Negative point, you need to have patent licensing in place. And, uh, you don't, if, if, if you've ever took care of patent licensing of G729, then you really, uh, you really get gray hair if you want to patent license uh, AMR because you have to deal with Nokia, you have to deal with Ericsson, and you have to deal with a Japanese uh, mobile network operator. And the Japanese mobile network operator, when we contacted them, they even refused to answer at the beginning. So that was really like, come on. We, we want to give you money, you know? Um, but okay, um, but you really need, um, for commercial use, you need to have a patent license. Um, so do you use the AMR for transcoding? Yeah, or? yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, the mobile handsets, uh, the Volta handsets, according to the specification, only speak AMR narrowband and AMR wideband. Three, two different uh, types of AMR. Um, on the engineering versions, you can activate G711 but you would never find that in the production field. It's only for lab testing G711. So yeah, AMR is mandatory, unfortunately. A quick point on that. Um, it's relatively straightforward to get a license for AMR if you work through uh, VoiceAge in Canada, who uh, they act as an agent for all of the license holders. Yeah, but it's only one of them, and they only do AMR HD, to my information. No, yeah. Okay. 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 Good. To, uh, because I spoke with them a year ago, and they told me we only have one license, and you need to get other licenses as well. But okay, maybe, maybe I'm I'm wrong. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. Um, as mentioned earlier, we use the Zip Express Media Server for AMR narrowband. Not only for AMR narrowband, but also because we want to do some basic topology hiding, and we want to do transcoding, we want to do maybe session timers to do some extra keep alives, um, stuff like that. All the configurations we use for them um, are in the examples uh, directory of Kamayu. So it's really pretty, should be straightforward to download and install. And um, even Zems, even though Zems is a more like a Zip Express media server, Zip Express uh, application server, we use it probably like most other people as well, uh, just as an SPC, as a session border controller. Um, if you install Zems, it's basically just go to etc default Zems, change run Zems into yes, and then you should be almost good to go. The second thing we need is the RTP engine from Zipwise. Zipwise has done a tremendous good job on its uh, RTP engine as a drop-in replacement for RTP proxy. Um, but due to the nature of IMS, due to the nature of, uh, of the network, we need uh, to separate uh, the traffic. We need to have one instance for mobile originating and one instance for mobile terminating traffic. Um, the reason for this is basically quite simple. If I, if I make a call coming from my handset, I'm going through my proxy CSCF. And um, if I do, for example, voice over Wi-Fi, I need to do some encryption. So I, need to, I may need to decrypt my voice, uh, my RTP on the proxy CSCF. Also, if I want to do um, maybe some web RTC, NXU was a good example, uh, then we need to do some decryption on the proxy CSCF. Because we are sending the call to the IMS core, and we don't know what's gonna happen with it. So inside the IMS core, we need to have some sort of a standard. We need to say, okay, our application server speaks G711, our interconnect speaks only G711, so we need to do some transcoding. And obviously, maybe our application server, our interconnects don't speak uh, secure RTP, so most likely we will have to, we have to um, decrypt our, our audio session. Um, 
but now we've got our originate, originating session on the proxy CSF going to the IMS core. And, well, okay, um, we may have the case that the call is returning to our proxy CSF going to a different phone. If I would use the same instance of RTP engine, it would say, okay, I know the session. This, we've been there, uh, we can reuse it, but it won't really um, work the way we want it to work, basically. So that's why um, we need two different uh, instances of RTP engine. The configuration of RTP engine is pretty straightforward. It's just, uh, it can be found in ETC default RTP engine. Yeah? Um, <laughs> it sits on the proxy CSCF. Together with RTP Engine. Together with RTP Engine. And uh, at the moment, it's only activated in case we need to do transcoding. Um, this comes actually quite useful because, um, as I mentioned, um, my Volta handsets speak uh, AMR narrowband and AMR wideband. And uh, on the class four interconnect, for example, we use in our lab or we use in most deployments, we, um, we only speak G711. Okay, that's de facto standard for uh, interconnects. So it doesn't really make sense to do AMR wideband transcoding um, if, if, we, if we want to convert that to G711 anyway. Um, if I have a voltage to voltage call, then of course, maybe I want to use AMR wideband because it's really crisp, great sound. So, but for that, we don't need transcoding because we're just passing this through. It's really straightforward, simple. It's just, uh, we just, on the, on the ZEMS, we basically just add G711 as another option. That's, yeah. Um, just, just as an example, um, we have um, in some of our setups, we have an application server. That application server is running either free switch or asterisk, depending on the setup. And uh, of course, it's technically possible to add AMR to the application server, but it's much easier if we need to do it, uh, if, we, if, we, if we anyway to need, need to do it, we just do it at the beginning because we, definitely needed for the interconnect. So it wouldn't make sense to add the AMR codec to the application server. Okay. Um, okay. Um, wait, wait, wait. Um, with any of our uh, of our configurations that we we build, we try to separate parts that are specific one for one host, like let's say IP addresses, let's say um, maybe network names, let's say um, I don't know database connections uh, from the main routing logic, because it's really. A, uh, quite useful in terms of, of, of maintenance. We have uh, one Kamali CFG running on all of our uh, proxy CSCF, and the only difference is really uh, the proxy CS, the PCSCF CFG file. And in the PCSCF CFG file, which is really only the only configuration file that you need to touch, uh, you find the listening interfaces 
what uh, ports are we listening on. In this case, we're listening on UDP, TCP, TLS, and a web socket. And we need to define, okay, what's our network name? What's our roaming network? And we need to define, okay, some database connections. It's really um, um, nothing really big magic here. In the end, we also got some um, defines, which basically enable, disable uh, certain specific um, functionalities. Like, for example, if you want to use XML RPC for doing some uh, monitoring, for doing some um, stuff like that, then we need to define with XML RPC. If you want to do TLS, okay, define with TLS. Um, if you want to do Rx, which is important for quality of service, uh, we need to define with Rx. But then, uh, in addition, we have to define that we want to use Rx for registrations, and we want to use Rx for calling. Listen carefully to what I said before. Uh, Rx is not only about quality of service. It's the main purpose to have quality of service, but it's basically our interaction with the mobile network. Um, Rx is basically like, um, if I'm connected to my mobile network, uh, one of the main uh, topics is that I want to be really uh, careful about battery life because uh, everybody knows this. Um, if I have uh, lots of applications running on my device, it really uh, sucks the battery. So uh, what we do on the mobile network is um, that we register for a week. We, see, uh, we, say, we send a register and it's valid for one week. And, um, of course, it may happen, and it's more, and it's really likely that um, that you get disconnected. Either you switch off your phone, and uh, the phone fails to deregister, or you, you go somewhere where you don't have any um, any any coverage anymore, stuff like that. You can actually use RX to trigger a deregistration on the mobile network, so you can you say, okay, I'm registered. You send an RX request. And you get from the mobile network the information, okay, uh, this guy is registered, but he's gone. He's away. So that's why we, that's another use case for AX. Um, this schematic, you find this on the proxy CSCF, on the interrogating CSCF, on the serving CSCF, on all of our hosts. It's really um, pretty straight, uh, hopefully straight, straightforward. I tried to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, um, for the interrogating CSCF, say basically, basically for the serving CSCF, we've got a second configuration file, which is important. And that's actually the diameter connection. In this uh, ICFCF XML, we have um, what diameter peers we are connecting to, what, uh, what applications we are supporting, what uh, basic, all the basic diameter configuration. So we've got the ICFCF, which is all about our zip, about our functionality, and we've got the ICFCF XML for the diameter connection. Um, the interrogating CSCF of Camaglio has a very basic, simple database, um, which is used in case um, that I send a call to an unregistered user. It's really for the case um, I'm, I'm, I'm calling on my mobile and I'm not registered on the network. So I need to make some decision where to, to send the call because I don't get this information from the home subscriber server. Um, also, if I'm doing the initial attachment to the mobile network, then as interrogating the CSCF needs to know what are the possibilities I have uh, for a serving CSCF. So you need to um, change a little bit in the database of the interrogating CSCF. Uh, serving CSCF 
pretty much the same. Uh, on the serving CSCF, um, the only thing you may um, want to, uh, that you need to be aware of is uh, that you may have more than one uh, diameter connection. Uh, because on the one hand, you typically have uh, CXDX for the profile and the account and uh, for everything else, but also you may have, uh, for example, RO or IF uh, for online charging, for all kinds of charging um, peers. Okay, um, now I've basically configured Walter and everything that's uh, related to that. But uh, having only Walter to Walter calling is, I would say, most likely boring. Um, so, um, if you want to make inbound calling, you have to send the calls to the interrogating call session control function. Because uh, the inter interrogating call session control function is some sort of uh, stupid load balancer which will select the right serving CSCF or it will select an application server for you where you should um, send your call. Outbound calling on the serving CSCF are defined in the dispatcher list. On the dispatcher list, we, we didn't implement really um, huge uh, magic about uh, least cost routing or stuff like that, but we just used dispatcher because uh, we decided that uh, we have an intelligent gateway that will do the least cost routing for us. Having said in the beginning that DNS is mandatory and it is, it is important, enum is important as well. Enum is also something like we had in the, in the 90s, I guess, or something, where, where everybody had this great uh, idea that uh, we were able to connect to each other. And we are using Enum now to do, uh, for, for, for doing a lookup on the number to the according IMS core that we are connected to. Yeah. Um, now that we've got basic calling, we want to add applications. Having applications like call forwarding, like announcements, like uh, maybe, maybe maybe add a voice API to provide some more interactive functionality, maybe add SMS, maybe video voice conferencing, all kinds of stuff like that. The good thing about IMS is now you've got the basic core configured. You've got everything that you need to to, to, to operate your mobile network. Now you can really focus on adding applications. And basically anything that speaks zips, zip can be an application. In our deployments, we use FreeSwitch, we use Asterisk, we use Camaleo. It really depends on the application that we are running. But the only thing is it needs to talk zip. It's really straightforward. Um, all the configurations, all the zone files, everything uh, I had in my presentation here um, is in the examples folder of the Camaleo project. Um, I've just did uh, push some updates yesterday evening <laughs> um, because uh, the configuration files we had there were a little bit outdated, <laughs> I would say. But since yesterday, they are up to date. Okay. Um, Just a quick question. Yeah. So this means that uh, the, the IMS functionality is part of the core Camayo project now? Yeah. It's not a separate thing we need to add? No, no. Out of the box, it's kind of there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, everything we need to run a mobile network is we have in Kamali right now. Um, yeah. Well, not, not the HSS with the diameter server. Okay, uh, for the HSS, we need to use um, we we use um, the open HSS from uh, Fraunhofer as an example or. Um, for example, we in one deployment we use an Ericsson HSS. Um, if you, aha, okay, there's one more topic I need to, to mention talking about the HSS. Is if I um, 
connect my mobile network, uh, if, I com if I connect my handset to the mobile network, then basically the same authentication is used uh, for the zip authentication than on the mobile network. And uh, on the mobile network, we have sequence numbers, and those need to be in sync. So the HSS you have definitely needs to, to serve uh, the authentication of the, of the mobile network as well, which is a tricky part because, uh, yeah. Uh, but that's just an important side note. Um, what do you use for a diameter server? Um, um, at the moment, we use, uh, for the diameter server, um, we use uh, JBoss and MobiSense. But um, it's a bit yeah, we're moving away from that at the moment. That's <laughs> and um, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I think three months ago um, we did our first uh, diameter server running on Camaleo. No zip involved, just diameter. Yeah, but. Uh, it was great in terms of performance. Well, in, terms of, in terms of free and open source options, stay tuned. Yeah, I would say, yeah. Come to my talk on Friday, and then, <laughs> um, yeah, there I'll talk a little bit about diameter and charging, in that matter of fact, and uh, yeah, more things to come, actually. More questions? Yeah? Yeah. Um, how many operators are implementing? Um, I have to make sure that I don't break any NDAs here. Um, <laughs> uh, there's one big operator in South Korea who's actually implementing it, um, and we're testing it uh, together with another operator in Europe. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, the operator in Europe is actually quite big in the, in the interconnection and roaming market, so that's why they were really pushing for, for Ravel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> IPsec is a little bit of a... Of a, of a complex task. Uh, we haven't added IPsec to the proxy CSCF yet, because for pure Volta we don't need IPsec. Um, and actually, if you look at the three GPP standards, it's, um, it says like 20 pages, you should use IPsec, you should use IPsec for this and that reason, IPsec, IPsec, IPsec. And basically the last sentence is, or an alternative secure encryption method. So um, for voice over Wi-Fi, uh, at the moment, we do secure RTP and uh, zip secure, which is sufficient according to the specification and most important supported by the handsets. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, if I take on my uh, private mobile handset, for example, um, as I mentioned, it doesn't support um, it doesn't support um, Volta yet. So, for example, I use Soiper. Raw. What? Raw. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the thing is, Zyper, Zyper is running as an application on top of the of the handset. So it's really has to stay awake, it has to be notified, stuff like that. So it really eats a bit of resources. It's not that bad, but it still takes a lot of resources. If I take my mobile handset, it's uh, integrated in the device, and it's integrated into the modem. It's really done on hardware level, all the zip stuff. That's why um, you really have to push the proper configuration um, on the onto the modem to, to make Volta work. As a matter of fact, uh, basically Qualcomm, I think, um, as a main manufacturer of uh, LTE modems had, 
have had the functionality to do Volt to do IMS for 10 years, something like that, and it's basically most of the of the of the of the device manufacturers simply didn't activate that feature on the LTE modem, but it's been in the device for for, for years now. So it's yeah. And the main difference is really since it's hardware, it's running it's running on the LTE modem. It's yeah, way better in terms of battery drain. I can I can use my Volta lab handset. I have to admit that I use it in the lab mostly. Um, it lasts for three four days without charging the battery. I cannot do that with my private phone, definitely not. Well, ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Matt and I were talking here and trying to understand, uh, I guess I should say Matthew instead of Matt, just to make a distinction. Uh, <laughs> between uh, the division of labor between RTP engine and SEMP in this case uh, obscures whether there is in an idealized IMS core of an operator and, and, and AMR principle, or whether in general AMR is transcoded only down to the edge, uh, which, so, which is to say. Uh, yeah. So uh, Matthew had the question, a very valid question, uh, why can't you just do all your RCP relay through SEMS? And perhaps the implication is that in many cases you won't need to transcode. Exactly. So what I wonder is across these interconnects and ultimately down to the handset on the other end, mm -hmm. uh, is the implication that the call will traverse, say, as G711 through the core and get transcoded back down to AMR at the edge? And if so, why are there two steps of transcoding and what is the idealized methodology versus the reality? How does it work? Uh, okay. Um, at the moment, it's more like this. Um, If I, um, if I make a call originating from my mobile handset, then it will only send AMR as a codec. Uh, then it goes through RTP engine, basically for, we need to send it through uh, some sort of RTP relay. We could use ZAMS as well, but uh, RTP engine is way better in terms of performance. Um, and it, but it's going to be transcoded anyway. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. It's not gonna be transcoded anyway. Um, it's only uh, what, what Zems does is actually add keep AMR and most likely keep AMR wideband and uh, add G711. And then only do the transcoding if the other side uh, de decides to use um, uh, G711. So in that case, um, uh, Zems will simply uh, pass, pass through the RTP without any transcoding. Um, it really depends on your on your user space um, because, um, for example, um, I'm probably a good example myself because I've got an LTE capable phone. So I'm, if I had an LTE only operator in Germany, I would say, okay, let's go with that. Uh, but I don't have a Volta phone. It's speaking LTE, but Volta. In those cases, uh, we deploy an OTT app like Zoiper. Uh, because, uh, yeah, not everyone has a, a Volta phone enabled, and even with the devices we have, it's still a little bit tricky. Um, so on the Zoiper handsets, for example, we use uh, G711 and don't, not AMR. So in that case, we don't need to do any uh, transcoding. We no, don't need to do any interaction on uh, ZEMS already. So it really, it really depends on, on, on what, what, your, what your users going to look like. Yeah. Let's say I want to start a small regional operator and I built yeah. out this topology as you describe it and I wanted to integrate it with uh, other mobile operators and connect globally. What is the envision? You, uh, path? Um, is it AMR end-to-end -end or no? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it is. Actually, it is. On, the, on one mobile network that, uh, that we are running this is... Uh, uh, they actually enable AMR on their gateways just to facilitate, f facilitate that because they said, okay, uh, we don't want to do any transcoding on the Volta cloud. We don't want to, if, if you use Volt, if you use AMR, that's fine. Uh, but just if you leave the network, if you go to other networks, then we need to enable AMR. Okay. So that would be the ideal 
wave, probably. And probably restrictions on the application server and its associated licensing play into this as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so, uh, so to be clear, for those of us who are mobile ignorant, uh, an LTE-capable phone in no way implies multi, no support. Um, it's, it's, it's always a little bit up to the handset manufacturer. The, like, 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 for example, if I take my Nexus 6 Google phone, basic Google Android, um, if you go to T-Mobile US, you will get operating settings that will actually enable Walter on my phone. But uh, in Germany, no way. I don't get it from T-Mobile in Germany. So it's really um, operator-defined. Operator -defined. At the moment, yeah. Yeah, can I add to that? About every, sorry. <laughs> uh, about every uh, mobile phone, well, they all are licensed for AMR. So we've got to try and kill off G70 learning. It's just kind of this old fashioned, nasty old narrow band mm -hmm. codec, which kind of lives on because it's the most common de de denominator. Yep. Uh, AMR completely spanks uh, AMR when it comes to performance at every instance. So, 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 yeah, exactly. yeah. Yes, yes, it is patented, but every handset that you get, all of these mm. devices, they're all licensed anyway, so you don't have to buy the license. Well, but not the not, but not the exploring infrastructure. Yeah, you, you only have to worry about the, the licensing uh, if you, if you, if you, when you transcode. Well, that's like exactly. that's that every polycom is licensed for G729, yes, but that doesn't really help most of them. Uh, <laughs> So that, what do you mean doesn't help most of you? Well, for example, those of us who do uh, free and open source VoIP are in no way assisted by that fact because we still have to procure patented licenses for G729 on asterisk, free switch, etc. Yeah, but, but that's what I'm saying. You only have to worry about the licenses for when you transcode. Mm -hmm. And so the number of licenses you, you need to transcode, it's actually very small. Except for the application server part, voicemail, yeah, but exactly, exactly. La, 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 like for this, uh, actually, also because maybe it's a little bit more simple. We uh, because we need to do transcoding for the interconnect. We also do transcoding for application servers because we uh, decided that we have a, a common way of, of talking to each other, which is G711 and G722, because uh, we don't have to pay any license for that, and uh, the proxy CSCF will do the transcoding based on them. So from a business perspective, what would ever motivate a mobile operator to connect with another one without providing an AMR path over that interconnect? Why is this transcoding required on the interface? It's because they're lazy, Alex. <laughs> uh, and yeah. at the moment, they're their existing gateways uh, default to G711. And it's lazy. Mm. Um, but it, it's a nasty thing to do. You start off with a nice uh, 16 kilohertz wide band codec, and then you ram it down into a, a horrible 8 kilohertz G711 yeah, vulnerable, non robust. Mm. It's, yes, let's not go there. So the implication mm -hmm. is that there's common network elements in this interconnect that are used for fixed line as well. Yeah. So there's other historical baggage that comes. Exactly. In. So exactly. These aren't purely IMS oriented. No. Interconnects. No. No. Okay. Okay. That makes more sense. Um, just as a good example, if I, in one of our deployments, uh, they actually even use the HR HD codec on the 3G network. So um, if I connect to a 3G network phone. Uh, we get AMR wideband on the on the interconnect as well. No need for transcoding. What? I. There's an operating profile. Yeah, operator profile. Yeah. Uh, which then uh, lightens up the options on the handset. Exactly. If you want to find out more, uh, I'll tell you about it later. Yeah. If you have more information on that, send it to me as well. Two <laughs> questions. Uh, we talked about IPR on AMR. Uh, does it apply to the rest of the, the IMS stack? Um, I have to be careful. I'm not aware of any standards. I, I can't say that there aren't any, but I'm not aware of any. You haven't had no 
you know, there are proprietary bits on the some of the implementations, but the standards themselves are. Yeah, exactly. The other question is related to handsets. How many different handsets have you been able to successfully? Okay, we've got. Yeah, okay. OTT, any handset. Yeah. That's, that doesn't really matter. We've got the Samsung S6, S6 Edge. We've got the Huawei Ascent P8. We've got the. Um, what else do we have? We had uh, Sony Xperia Lumia. No, no not uh, Sony Xperia. We had the Microsoft Lumia. We've had. Okay, the iPhone, we didn't spend too much time on it because Apple is a little bit like. Uh, we don't talk to you, but uh, anyway. We can help you with the iPhone. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Yeah, but a whole bunch of handsets, actually. And your experience when testing, uh, is it mostly straightforward? <laughs> um, I would say uh, with, 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 with Samsung. Samsung is the most popular for testing in Walter, actually. And with Samsung, you get almost every two weeks, you get a new firmware version from Samsung for the engineering version. And with every new version, you get old bugs solved and new bugs added. So it's really, um, with, with, with Apple, I made the experience that uh, we don't care about standards, we're Apple. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. yeah. Apple's easier because Apple is a standard in itself. It claims standard. <laughs> yeah. um, um, but then what you do is you engineer your core onto what Apple do. <coughs> just the other way around. Okay. But it's a bit of cat and mouse then. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think if there are no more questions. Then, from the G7 fan club. yeah, <laughs> uh, I think then it's coffee break, I guess.